Soon enough, he was there, and almost to his surprise, he found Vlad right away, sitting in Tem's house drinking wine and watching the door, as if he was waiting for Savin, and the smile he gave seemed to confirm this. There were three or four familiar faces as well, but no one Savin felt the need to speak to. He sat down with the Easterner and gave him a good day, which Vlad returned and offered to buy him a glass of ale. Savin accepted. Vlad signaled Tem, and Savin couldn't help but notice the glance the housemaster gave him as he set the ale down. He wondered if he should be annoyed, and concluded that he didn't really care. When Tem had returned to his place behind the counter, Savin said, I've been thinking about our lesson all day. Can you show me some more? Certainly, said Vlad. But are you sure you want to be seen with me so much? Why not? Didn't you notice the looks you've been getting? I guess I have, said Savin. I noticed it earlier today, too, when I was here with my sister. But why? Because you're with me. Why do they care about that? Either because I'm an Easterner, or because they still think I had something to do with the death of Reigns. Oh, but you didn't, did you? I've been wondering about that, said Vlad. Savin stared at him. What do you mean? Well, I didn't kill him, said Vlad. But that doesn't mean I had nothing to do with his death. I don't understand. As I said before, I doubt it's coincidence. I wish said Savin slowly. Master Wag could have learned what killed him. Your master has failed? Savin considered the master's words about not having given up, and he said, Yes, he doesn't know. Then I do. Savin felt his eyes growing wide. What? I know what killed him. How could you? Because Master Wag failed. That is all the information I need. But, well... What was it? Sorcery. Savin shook his head. Master Wag said that sorcery leaves traces. Certainly, if used in a simple, straightforward way, such as causing the heart to stop, or inducing a hemorrhage, or in a way that leaves a visible wound. But then, what happened to him? Do you know what necromancy is? Well, not exactly. Necromancy, in its most basic form, is simply the magic of death. Those particular forces that are released when a living thing passes from existence. There are those who study ways to cheat death, ways to extend or simulate life, attempting to erase the difference between life and death, and some study the soul, that which exists after the death of the body, and where it goes, which leads to the study of other worlds, of places that cannot normally be reached, and those beings who live there, such as gods and demons, and the forces that operate between worlds, places where life meets unlife, where reality is whim, and truth dances to the drum of desire, where... I don't understand. Oh, sorry. I was rambling. The point is, a skilled necromancer would be able to simply send a soul into limbo without doing anything that would actually kill the person. And the person would just die? Usually. Usually? What happens the rest of the time? I don't want to talk about it. It doesn't matter in this case, anyway. A necromancer could achieve the effect you saw in Reigns. What about the horse? What about it? Well, it bolted, as if it were afraid of something. That doesn't surprise me. Animals are often very sensitive to magic. Especially the dumber beasts. There was something odd in the way he said that, as if he were sharing a joke with himself. Savin thought all of this over and said, But who? Laron, of course. I mean, Baron Smallcliff. He is a necromancer. Moreover, he is undead himself, which proves that he is a skilled necromancer if I hadn't known it before. Want me to believe his lordship is a vampire? A vampire? Hmm. Maybe. Do you know of any cases of mysterious death? Blood drained, all that? No. If something like that happened around here, I'd have heard of it. So perhaps he is not a vampire. 
Although that proves nothing. Proves nothing. Sethra is a vampire, but she still eats and drinks and requires very little blood. Who? An old friend. I think I've heard of her, said Savin. Although I can't remember from where. Doubtless just someone with the same name. I suppose. But do you really know a vampire? An odd one. Never mind. Still, I wonder what he is... What other sorts of undead are there? I'm not an expert on the subject. Perhaps dear Lord Smallcliffe will let me use his library to look it up. But then you could just ask him. I wasn't serious, said Lon. Oh. I can't believe his lordship is undead. Why not? Well, because... Uh... I just can't. I understand, said Vlad. All your life, there are people you just assume you can trust, yet you don't really know them. Then, out of nowhere, someone walks up to you and asks you to believe that one of them is some kind of monster. I wouldn't believe it either. At least, not without a lot more proof than you've seen. Savin stared at him, not certain what to say. He seemed to be talking to himself, and once more... Savin felt the undercurrent of hatred in the Easterner's voice. That's how they do it. That's how they get away with everything. Because it's so much easier just to go along with what you're told than to look at. He caught himself, as if aware that he had left his listener far behind. For a moment he seemed to be thinking about trying to explain. Then he shrugged. Believe it or not, as you will. What I want to know is what the son of, uh, what the fellow has planned. The coincidence, as I said, is too great. It can't just kill me the way he killed Reigns, so... Huh? He wants to kill you? He does indeed. But I'm protected rather better than Reigns was. Oh. But why would he want to kill you at all? He has reasons. Savin thought about this. So what is he going to do? He asked. I wish, said Vlad, that I had some means of figuring that out. There's probably no point in running once things have gone this far. Besides, I owe him for reigns. You owe him? You said something about that before. What do you mean? Vlad shrugged. I was mostly talking to myself, but I just wish I knew what he was planning. Can't witchcraft tell you? It's not very useful for seeing the future. That's too bad. Maybe. So what are you going to do? Try to find out, said Vlad. I have other ways. Sometimes they even work. He stared off into the distance, as if he were commuting things unseen. Seven. I will not marry a poor musician. I will not marry a poor musician. He'd be playing and I'd be wishing. Heidi, Heidi, hola. Step on out. Vlad toyed with his salad but ate little. Either because he didn't like the taste or because he was thinking of other things. Savin ate his own salad with, if no great delight, at least considerable appetite. Savin felt Vlad watching him, which made him slightly nervous as he squeezed an expensive piece of lemon over the cheese and vegetables, put another handful of salad into his mouth, and wiped his hand on his shirt. The Easterner sighed. I know a place, he said, where one could eat every day for half a year and never taste the same dish twice. Where the servers are discreet and efficient, you never noticed them. But there is always a full plate in front of you and wine in your glass. Where the room is quiet and serene and tasteful, calling the diner's attention to the delight of the tongue. Where the appetizer is fresh, enticing, and excites the senses like the first touches of love. Where the fruit is sweet and plump, or tart and crisp, and compliments the cheese as the salad compliments the bread. With reverence and solemn joy, where there is a choice of wine to suit the most diverse taste, yet each has been selected with care and tenderness. Where each meat is treated with the honor it deserves, and is allowed to unfold its own flavor in the natural juices the gods gave it. 
with touches of savory, ginger, or tarragon, added to direct added to direct the attention of the palate to the hidden joys which are unique to that particular cut. Do you know what I am saying? A place where the mushroom and the onion dance with the wine, and the peppers in sauces that fire the palate, and the sweet at the end of the meal is the encore to a symphony of the heart. Where? You don't much like the food here, do you? said Savin. There is quiet and ease with only that conversation that flows like the wine from the bottle, easy and natural, and all else, save the sounds of dining, is the silence that food requires for. There isn't any music. I thought the best taverns had music. Vlad sighed and returned from his reverie. No, there is no music. I don't like music when I eat. Although, he added, I must admit that here, music would be a welcome distraction. Well, you are likely to get your wish. There will probably be someone arriving today or tomorrow. There hasn't been a minstrel in several days, and there are usually one or two a week. Besides, harvest is almost over, and they always show up around the end of harvest. Indeed, said Vlad, sounding suddenly interested. A minstrel? Good. Why? I like minstrels, said Vlad. You mean you like to listen to them, or they are the sort of people you like? Both, actually. You've known minstrels, then? Several. I didn't know they had them in the big cities. Just about anything you can find outside the city, you can find in it as well. Really? Yes. Vlad looked thoughtful for a moment, then added, Although there are exceptions. Savin returned to his salad, while waiting for Vlad to continue. When the Easterner did not do so, Savin swallowed and said, One of the exceptions. What? Oh, peace and quiet, for example, said Vlad. You don't know how pleasant these things are unless you've gone most of your life without them. Do you know, when I left the city I had trouble sleeping for quite a while, just because I wasn't used to the silence? That seems odd. Yes. It seems odd to me, too. When did you leave? Shortly after the uprising. What uprising? Vlad granted him another indecipherable look. This one a quick frown. He said, There was some trouble in the city with the Easterners and the Tekla. Oh, said Savin. Yes, I heard something about that. Didn't some traitors kill Her Majesty's personal guards and try to kidnap her? Not exactly, said Vlad. Wait a minute, said Savin. Were you involved in that? Is that why you had to? No, said Vlad. I was involved, I suppose, but only in trying to stay out of the way. Well, what did happen? Vlad shook his head. For the most part, I don't know. There was almost a war, and there was conscription, and there was blood, and then it was over. What's conscription? When they put you in the army or the navy and send you off to fight. Oh. I should like that, I think. Vlad gave him another quick glance, then almost smiled and said, I wouldn't know myself. I've never been in the army. Well, but you've killed people. It's the same thing, isn't it? Vlad laughed briefly. Good question. There are soldiers who would disagree with you. I tend to think you're right, though. Who's to say? I used to dream about being a soldier, said Savin. Did you? That seems odd. On the one hand a soldier, on the other a physiker. Well, but... I see what you mean. But when I wanted to be a soldier it was... I don't know. Different. I know, said Vlad. When one dreams of being a soldier, one imagines killing the enemy but not seeing the enemy bleed, or seeing friends bleed for that matter. Savin nodded slowly. I was young and... He shrugged and smiled a little. I thought the uniforms looked so nice. And the idea, said Vlad, of getting away from here? Maybe, though I never thought about it that way. Have you ever known a soldier? 
I've no warriors, said Lod. What's the difference? Another good question. Another good question. I'm not sure, but that's how they described themselves. What were they like? Arrogant, but not unpleasantly so. Did they frighten you? Vlad laughed. At one time or another, nearly everyone I've ever known has frightened me. Even your friends? Especially my friends. But then, I've had some unusual friends. Yes. And one of them is a vampire. Indeed. That would frighten me, said Savin thoughtfully. There's something about the idea of someone who should be dead that... You still say his lordship is undead? Yes. Do you really mean it? Yes. Savin shook his head. I still don't believe it. I know. How do you talk to someone who's undead? I mean, isn't it creepy? Vlad shrugged. You get used to... He stopped, his eyes straying toward the door. Ah. You must be prescient. The minstrel, I suppose. Savin turned, and indeed a lady was just coming in the door to the smiles of Tem and the few patrons of his house. She wore a travel-worn white blouse and pants, with a green vest and a light green cloak. She carried a pack slung at her hip, and hanging at her back were a long-necked cordu and a shiny black horn or pipe-like instrument that Savin didn't recognize. Savin thought she was very pretty. Annie Sola, remarked Vlad. Green and white, agreed Savin. He was always excited when a minstrel arrived, but especially so when it was a noble, because they always had a wider variety of instruments and songs, and could tell stories of what happened in the courts of the Highborn. But whatever magic caused news to spread, people were beginning to drift into Tem's house already, before the minstrel had finished speaking with Tem, presumably making arrangements for a room and meals in exchange for songs and stories, news and gossip. Vlad said, I'm going to have to speak with her, but that can wait. Oh? Why? Minstrels know things. But will she speak to you? Why not? Oh, because I'm an Easterner? I suspect that won't be a problem. Savin started to ask why, but changed his mind. He was, he decided, beginning to be able to anticipate when he was reaching a subject the Easterner wouldn't want to discuss. The minstrel finished her discussion with Tem, and with a surprisingly shy-looking smile directed at everyone present, she went back toward the chambers that Tem let out to travelers. Tem cleared his throat and said, She'll be back and play for us in a few minutes, after she's refreshed herself. This seemed to be a pleasing prospect to everyone. More and more people drifted into the house. As they did, Savin couldn't help but notice that many, perhaps most of them, looked at him sitting with the Easterner, then quickly looked away. He caught a glimpse of what might have been disgust in Fury's expression, and dark-haired Lova, who was sitting next to Fury, seemed faintly puzzled. Lan and Tuck were sitting together with some of their friends, and though Tuck only looked at the table in front of him, Lan seemed, for a moment, to be looking at Savin unpleasantly. For the first time, he began to seriously question whether he ought to be seen with Vlad so much. Vlad looked at him with a slightly amused expression, and Savin wondered if his thoughts were being read. But Vlad said nothing, and presently the minstrel returned. She had changed to a loose, clean white blouse with green embroidery, and her leggings were a light, fresh green. Her hair was brown with a subdued but unmistakable noble's point, and her eyes, very dark, stood out sharply in contrast to her complexion and clothing. She carried both of her instruments and set them at a table in the corner that was hastily cleared for her. Her teeth were white when she smiled. Greetings, my friends, she said in a melodic, carrying voice. My name is Sarah. I play the reed pipe and the cordu, and I sing, and I even know a few stories. If there were a drink in front of me, I might play something. The drink was provided quickly. She smiled her thanks and sipped from whatever she'd been given, nodded approval, and poured some of the liquid over the mouthpiece of the long black flute. What's she doing? 
whispered Savin. Vlad shrugged. It must be good for him. She wouldn't wreck her own reed, her own reed. I've never seen one of those before. Not in a I wonder what it sounds like. This question was answered almost at once, when a low, rich, dark sound emerged and at once spread as if to fill every corner of the room. She went up and down the scale once or twice, and the instrument went both higher and lower than Savin would have guessed. Then she began to play an eerie, arrhythmic tune that Savin had never heard. He settled back to enjoy the music. Vlad's face was expressionless as he studied the minstrel. She sat on a table, one foot resting on a chair, tapping slowly and steadily, though Savin could not find a rhythm that she might be tapping to. When the tune ended, she played another, this one more normal, and while Savin couldn't remember its name, it was very familiar and seemed to please Tem's guests. After playing the pipe for a while, she picked up the other instrument, quickly tuned it, and with an expression of sweet innocence, began singing a scandalously bawdy song called I'll Never Trust a Shepherd, I'll Never Trust a Thief. That, without ever saying anything directly, implied things about her character and pleasures that Savin found unlikely. Everyone pounded on the tables, laughed, and bought Sarah more drinks. After that, she could do no wrong, and when she began singing an old, sweet ballad about Chalara and Ayuri, everyone sighed and settled back to become lost in music and sentimentality. In all, she performed for about two hours. Savin liked her singing voice. She chose good songs, and there were stories he had never heard before as well as some that were as familiar to him as his sister's face. Eventually, Sarah stood and bowed to the room at large, making it seem as if she were bowing to every man or woman present. Savin found himself whistling and slapping the table with everyone else. She said, You are all charming and very kind. With your permission, I will have something to eat, and then if you wish, I will play again in the evening and tell you what news I have. Everyone in the house did indeed so wish. <coughs> Sarah bowed again to acknowledge the compliment and carefully set her instruments down. For the first time since the minstrel had begun, Savin remembered the Easterner sitting next to him and said, Did you enjoy the music? Hmm? Oh yes, it was fine, said Vlad. He was looking quite fixedly at the minstrel, and his thoughts seemed to be elsewhere. Savin decided against asking what he was thinking about. He sipped his watered wine and looked around the room. Once more, he noticed people at other tables surreptitiously glancing at him, at Vlad, or at both of them. Savin drank slowly and let his mind drift, until, after perhaps a quarter of an hour, Vlad suddenly stood up. Are you leaving? asked Savin. No, I wish to speak with this minstrel. Oh. Vlad walked over to her. Savin stood up and followed. Good evening, my lady, began Vlad. The minstrel frowned at him briefly, but said, And a good evening to you as well. My name is Vlad. May I join you for a moment? As he spoke, he seemed to show her something in his hand. Savin looked at her face in time to see her eyes widen very briefly. Then she recovered and said, by all means, please sit down. It is a pleasure indeed to meet you, Vlad. Who is your friend? Mine. Vlad turned, and Savin realized that the Easterner hadn't known he'd been followed. For an instant he seemed annoyed, but he only shrugged and said, His name is Savin. How do you do, Savin? Savin found his voice and made a courtesy. Very well, my lady. Would you both do me the honor of sitting with me? They sat. Vlad said, Please accept my compliments on your performance. Thank you, she said. And to Savin, You seemed to be enjoying the music a great deal. Oh, I was, said Savin, while he wondered if the Isola's remarks contained a hint that she had noticed how little attention Vlad had actually been paying to the music. If so, Vlad gave no sign of it. First things first, said Vlad. He handed her a small piece of paper, 
folded so that Savin couldn't read it. The Isola opened it up, glanced at it, put it into her pouch, and smiled. Very well, my lord, she said. Now, what can I do for you? My lord, thought Savin, startled. How can an Easterner be my lord? I have a few questions for you. Perhaps you can answer them. Would you both do me the honor of sitting with me? They sat. Vlad said, Please accept my compliments on your performance. Thank you, she said. And to Savin. You seemed to be enjoying the music a great deal. Oh, I was, said Savin. While he wondered if the Isola's remarks contained a hint that she had noticed how little attention Vlad had actually been paying to the music. If so, Vlad gave no sign of it. First things first, said Vlad. He handed her a small piece of paper, folded so that Savin couldn't read it. The Isola opened it up, glanced at it, put it into her pouch, and smiled. Very well, my lord, she said. Now, what can I do for you? My lord, thought Savin, startled. How can an Easterner be my lord? I have a few questions for you. Perhaps you can answer them. Perhaps not. I will certainly try, said the minstrel. Do you know Baron Smallclay? Indeed, yes. I gave him a performance yesterday. Excellent. He paused, thinking, then glanced at Savin. I wonder, he said, if you would be so good as to return to the table, Savin. I'd really rather make this private if you don't mind. I don't mind, lied Savin. He stood and gave the minstrel another courtesy. It has been an honor to meet you, my lady, he said. And a pleasure to meet you, Savin, said the minstrel. As Savin walked back to the table, he felt that everyone was either staring at him or pointedly not staring at him. He glanced at his friends, and this time there was no mistake. Coral, who was speaking to the others, was at the same time directing a look of unconcealed hatred at Savin. The feeling of being the center of hostile attention suddenly became so strong that before Savin could reach his seat, he found that he had turned and begun walking toward the door. And by the time he reached it, he was running. How long he ran, or where he went, he did not know. But at last he found that he was lying on the soft grass of a hill, staring up at the dead night sky, breathing in the smell of autumn leaves. He tried to account for his friend's behavior, but he couldn't. He tried to understand his own reaction, his panicked flight, but his mind shied away from the subject. He thought about going back to Tem's house and asking his friends to tell him what the problem was. But what if they did? What if, as they were almost certain to do, they berated him for associating with the Easterner? What would he say? And, for that matter, why was he spending so much time with the Easterner? He stood up and looked around. He was west of town, not far from Master Wags, and quite near the road. The way home would take him past Thames House. He thought of taking a long way around but chided himself for cowardice. He climbed up to the road and turned toward town. It was late. May and Pei would be starting to worry about him soon. He broke into a jog. He passed Tem's house. It was quiet, and he thought about going in, but quickly rejected the idea. He had no intention of confronting his friends tonight, not until he knew what to say to them. His lengthening shadow cast by the lamp from Thames, preceded him down the road out of the cluster of buildings he thought of as town. As it disappeared, he nearly ran into an indistinct shape that appeared in front of him. He stopped, and the shape resolved itself into several. He thought three or four, individual areas of darkness darker than the night around them. It took the length of two breaths for Savin to realize that they were people. The panic that had gripped him before was suddenly back but he resolved not to give in to it. If it was only his imagination at work, he'd look ridiculous if he ran away. And if it wasn't, running probably wouldn't help. Hi, he said. 
I can't see who you are. There was the sound of soft laughter, and he knew, with stomach-dropping certainty, that his fear was not misplaced.